Hi, my name is Mike Gillard, and this is Self Made Man, the podcast for men who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of their lives. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. So as most of you know, I decided to do something incredibly risky this past year, and I made the decision to walk away from my 10-year-long career as an online educator in order to start a new company in the farming and hydroponics industry. And admittedly, this is a world that I knew very little about when I first started down this path, but I saw a huge problem and I had an idea for an incredible solution. And so I'm essentially in a completely new industry where I have absolutely no relationships. I'm developing a physical product for the very first time in my career. And the product that I'm developing is not only high tech, but it's the very first of its kind, which means I am in completely uncharted territory along with my design team. In addition to that, I've put all of my chips on the table for this. I am going all in financially, dumping essentially my life's savings into its multi-million dollar development. So either I'm going to walk away from this venture completely broke or with the biggest win of my life. So from the outside looking in, the risks are off the charts. And that is why I've brought my friend and mentor, Porter Stansbury, back to the show today. And for those of you who've been around for a while, Porter was the very first guest that I had on Self Made Man. Make sure you go listen to that episode if you have not. Uh, Because really, he's a living example of the values that this show stands for when it comes to building a company, serving the world, and raising a family. And what's interesting is that over the past year, he has made a similar gamble that I have. He took one foot out of his realm of mastery in the financial publishing industry with Stansberry Research, and he decided to develop a revolutionary new shaving razor for men in what is obviously a hugely competitive industry. But the fact that he's, one, never developed a physical product before, and two, (laughs) is going up against guys like Gillette and Dollar Shave Club and all of these other companies didn't stop him from declaring that he would create the best men's razor in the world, a razor without equal, and that you could and would want to pass down from generation to generation. The result is a company called One Blade, and the reviews have been unanimous. Porter has pulled it off, and he has developed the best product of its kind in the world. So today, he is here to share the story of One Blade with you and I from start to finish, It's going to include the good, the bad, the ugly, and so many incredibly valuable lessons learned. Uh, As you can imagine, this is an unbelievably valuable episode. So if you have a dream, if you want to create the best quality product or service in the world, if you want to create the Ferrari brand of your industry, then you are in for a treat. Here is Porter Stansberry and the story behind the development of One Blade. All right, welcome back, everybody. Mike Dillard here, and today we are have a revisit from our very first guest on the Self-Made Man podcast, Mr. Porter Stansbury. Porter, welcome back to the show. Mike, thanks for having me back. How's the podcast going? You know, it's going uh, It's going really well. I've gotten some unbelievable feedback from people who are just getting a tremendous amount of value from it. So it's been an unbelievably rewarding uh, endeavor for me to undertake. And uh, super grateful that you showed up for our very first episode and set the tone. And today, uh, I wanted to have you back to talk about One Blade, which is your brand new razor company that you launched a month ago. And Porter, I wanted to start by asking you, how in the world did this happen? Because you went from a massive financial publishing company to a physical products company and of all things, a super luxury high-end razor. And So how did this whole thing come about? Well, I try to explain it to my wife <laughs> this way. I, um, I think entrepreneurs don't see the world the way that other people do. I think that if you have the entrepreneurial bug or you have uh, the, the, the dreaming, uh, what you end up seeing is the world the way it could be. And I got my first straight razor shave and on vacation in Italy in 2002. I went with a group of buddies I've been friends with since high school. And that's, you know what, 13 years now uh, we went. And one of the things that we did was we got a straight razor shave. And I was not at all enthusiastic about the idea of letting another man put a a steel razor to my face. And my whole experience of shaving growing up had been miserable. I have sensitive skin and shaving with multi-bladed cartridge razors had caused me all kinds of skin problems, ingrown hairs and, and really painful shaves. And so I generally had a, I would, I would have like a three or four day beard at all times. And I just use a electric trimmer to trim it down. 
So I didn't really like shaving, and I, I, you know, I wasn't into getting a straight razor shave. But my buddy, who was Italian, was like, "No, you got to try. It. You've never had a real shave," and it was a transformative experience. I learned that with high quality steel and a better edge, you didn't have any of those skin problems. You could shave comfortably, and of course, having a really soft face, it feels really nice. If you haven't had a great shave, you should really try it. You should go get a straight razor shave and see how good it can feel. And so that experience got me into shaving as a hobby. So. Every time I'd go to a different city, I would look up the best barber. I'd go get a shave. I'd talk with him about the steel. I'd talk, see what equipment he used. And then at home, I got really into shaving with uh, what you would call old-fashioned razors. I'm sure you've seen these, the double-sided safety razors. Mm-hmm. And they can give you a very, very close, very good shave. In my opinion, far superior than any kind of cartridge. And let me just set the stage there for a minute. I'm not here to bash people who use an electric razor. And I'm not here to criticize Gillette or Harry's or whoever, whoever's cartridge you use. If you have a system that works for you, that is fantastic. I didn't, and I was interested in finding out why. And the more I learned, just the more into it I got. And what I finally uh, came, I finally realized after lots of trial and error is that there's sort of two types of shaving. There's the the single edged safety razor thing that you can do at home. And yeah, I know there are some people who use an actual straight razor at home, but that in my mind is just I mean, it's just a little crazy. I mean, I'm sure you can develop the skills and do a fine job, but I'm not going to give myself a straight razor shave every morning with a naked blade. It's just no way. There's just way too much that can go wrong. And so, and then the other side, of course, is the is the the cartridge razors that people use for convenience, and because it's essentially impossible to cut yourself with one. So, what I wanted to do over over time, as I learned this, I thought, man, you know, the safety razor, the double edge safety razor, is such a better shave. I don't have any skin problems, and I get a much closer shave, and and it's a cool tool. It's steel. It looks cool on my sink, and I don't have to deal with any plastic, and and I and I don't, you know, I just it's a better shave. But the problem is. I'd say about 50% of the time I would cut myself. And once or twice I cut myself really badly to where the bleeding wouldn't stop for hours. And I, you know, I had to miss a meeting one time because I just cut the corner of my nose and it just would not stop bleeding. So I shared these experiences with my friends and I got a lot of feedback from these guys. And they all said the same thing, which was that, yeah, I love shaving with a safety razor, but I don't do it every day because I know that if I cut myself, I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to keep my schedule or you know I'm going to be I'm going to be late to things so I don't trust myself with it. And so that's when the that's when the idea hit me. It was a very simple idea. Is can we can we combine the quality and the comfort and the masculinity and the materials of safety razors with the ease and the convenience and the safety of a cartridge razor. And that is the whole idea behind one blade. The whole idea was to merge the the best elements of each type of home shaving. And, and the, the purpose was that you, this way you can actually have the quality of a straight razor shave at home, even if you're not a great, even if your hand is not steady, even if you're not a great barber. And the, the um, I don't know if you've seen or not, but the online feedback from this product has been massive. We have been just overwhelmed with positive feedback. We've gotten positive reviews from two dozen, two dozen different men's magazines and the the blogosphere, as they call it now, full of positive comments. And it's been really exciting to see how many people love this product. People are making videos about this product for us and putting it on YouTube. I think we've just, in terms of product development, I think we've hit a home run because the tool does exactly what we designed it to do. And that's the hard part in product development. So you know, it's interesting you say that because I, I wanted to dive into the product development side. And I have a bit of an ulterior motive here because just like you for the last year, I uh, have started a new company with a physical product for the very first time. So I'm making the exact same transition. And I would love to know your your mindset when it came to the development. When you sat down, you said, okay, I have this idea for the razor. What do you want it to be? And for you, it's very obvious at this point, you wanted to develop the absolute best razor in the world and the best brand in the world. But if you could dive into that process a little bit, how did you find the industrial design firm that you ended up going with? Was there a process that you went through? And what did that process look like? How long did it take you? I think I I saw some of your marketing where y'all had two or 300 prototypes at one point that you were using and going through. Yeah, we we had a very unusual design process. Um, in the first place, we were we were lucky that we had a lot of capital. The idea that I had to start a a high quality razor business that would combine the elements of cartridge razors with the safety razors 
was popular and people thought that it would work. So we had lots of capital. And I don't know if I can explain this adequately in a short phone call, but I'm just genuinely only interested in the very best of things. I, I didn't I, – you'll think I'm lying, but I'm absolutely not lying. I didn't really care if we never sold a razor. I just wanted to make the best razor ever. I wanted to make the best razor that had ever been built. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the kind of person who's in love with the product. And if you look at my newsletters, I, I publish all kinds of newsletters that no one else will buy just because I really think they're the best. So as an example, that extreme value, it's a thousand dollar newsletter about value investing. It's the best research out there for deep value stocks. No one will buy it. We, we, <laughs> can't, we can't figure out a way to sell it, but I love having it as a product because I love reading it. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, I have, I have uh, not been as successful monetarily as I might have been because I, I fall in love with my products. And as a marketer, you know, that's very dangerous. So anyway, I just really wanted to create the best razor. So first thing I did was I had to hire someone who knew how to develop and source materials, who had knew, you know, knew how to, had built lots of new products before and knew how to find the design firm and knew how to you know, reach out to manufacturers for materials. I knew I knew nothing about that. I was smart enough to know I don't know how to do that. So I hired a recruiter and we were talking about who we could get to partner with us on this business. And I said, look, I want to hire a guy who doesn't want to partner with me. But I want to hire a guy who has the same passion I do for this. I don't want to, I don't want to be part-time with somebody. This has got to be someone who wants to spend the next 10 years of his life building the world's greatest razor and learning how to sell it. And he goes, well, you know, give me an idea of who, who if I could bring you out there in the world right now, who would, who would be good? And I said, you know, a product company I've always admired was Ronco. And I don't know if you remember Ronco, but they're the folks who did the little toaster ovens that you, you, know, you set it and you forget it. And they were famous for their infomercial marketing. But they actually created a whole range of really cool, great new products. And, of course, they had a lot of success. Do you, do you remember the story of Ron Papil? I, I remember the name. And I remember that they were big into infomercial direct response. But I don't remember any of their specific products off the top of my head. Yeah, they had a lot of really cool uh, kitchen products. And they had some sporting equipment and stuff like that that was very successful. And all was all really innovative. And, uh, you know, it wasn't high-quality materials. So... So that was, a, that was a wrinkle. But anyways, I said, look, if you could get me the CEO of Ronco, that's a guy that would know exactly what I'm trying to do and he would know how to do it. And so that's what the recruiter did. <laughs> he, hmm. called, he called the CEO of Ronco and he said, hey, uh, how, about, uh, how about doing a startup? And, you know, it was just, it was just really good timing. There had, Ronco had been sold to a private equity firm and the CEO was not in love with the new owners. And so it was a great transition for him. And it was remarkable that we got a guy like that who – Todd Barrett is his name, and he's, he's in his um, – he's in his – I think he just turned 50. He was in his late 40s when we started. Now he's 50 years old, and so he's a very well-established executive. He's not the kind of guy you would normally see leading a startup, but that really gave us so much credibility with manufacturers and with sourcing materials. They knew this guy was for real. They'd done business with him for you know 15 years in some cases. So we sent, we sent, we sent Todd all over the world looking at Blades. And we, our first idea, the first iteration of this was that we could stand out from the crowd if we made not only a great new razor, but if it had a blade that was something revolutionary. That was our first idea. Because, you know, if you want to be the best at something, uh, it's, it's easy. It's just to deserve it. So we, we spent a lot of time and money trying to develop the, the perfect razor blade. And we experimented with uh, new materials like tungsten and ceramics and even this uh, new thing called amorphous metal. Because we were looking for a razor that you would never have to change or you'd only have to change once every 30 days or something like that. We wanted to um, really have the materials uh, stand out in the marketplace. And what we found was that we did, even though we had a lot of capital, we didn't have nearly that much capital. So we, we burned through almost a million dollars experimenting with edges and blades and materials. And we just realized we weren't getting any closer to a very high quality, comfortable shave. In the meantime, you know, in Japan, there's a company called Feather that has spent 80 years and who knows how many hundreds of millions of dollars building the perfect shaving edge. And I just want you to understand, we could have used any razor blade we wanted in the world. So we tested them all and nothing compared to the quality of Feather's edges. And people oftentimes think that shaving is all about how sharp something is. And yeah, sharpness has a lot to do with it. That's true. But what makes it comfortable is that there is a perfectly smooth edge. There is, you know, even at a microscopic level, there are no striations. There are no dimples. There is nothing at all. It's a perfectly, perfectly smooth, perfect edge. And Feather has the world's best technology to build those. And in fact, its competitors still don't know how it 
nobody really knows how they do it. It's mm-hmm. a mixture of, of of the metallurgy they use and the coatings they use. It's incredibly difficult to, to produce a perfect edge. So anyways, we studied hundreds of razor blades under microscopes to find the perfect edge. We went with Feather because they had the best. And then from there, we went and we interviewed uh, 30 different design firms from around the United States. And we went with a group called Pensa. At, um, sorry, is it Pensa? It's um, – <laughs> I'm 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 involved in two businesses with almost exactly the same name. There's a there's an apartment investment group in Miami called Pensa, and there's a design <laughs> firm in New York called Pensa. So anyway, we went with the design firm in Brooklyn, and uh, they built the you know they just went crazy. They they started shaving in the office every day for a year using different razors. They, I mean, uh, when we would go to their offices, there would be hundreds of different razors all over the walls and the floors, and they studied. The, the physics of it and the actual mechanics of how the skin folds around the blade. And they did a ton of work and they discovered that there was really only two or three angles that really mattered. And what, and what really matters is the angle of the blade. And we found that 31.1 degrees is the perfect angle. Mm. And then there's a, a spacing issue. So how much space is between the blade and the guard? And uh, we, we experimented with, with lots of different um, spacing and there's a, there is a perfect space where you can get a very good, what they would call an aggressive shave, meaning that it's very, very close, uh, without cutting yourself. That was, of course, key for us. And one of the comments you'll see all over the blogospheres about our product is how our razor is unbelievably efficient. And what they mean by that is they get a really, really close shave, but they can do so quickly, effortlessly, without worrying about cutting themselves. And that's exactly what we were aiming for. And that really, the credit for that really belongs with our designers in New York. So you said that that process took you know, well over a year. Uh, were there any major setbacks or challenges that you ran into along the way? Whether- <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it actually took, it actually took uh, almost two years because we fooled around for a long time with the blade and we didn't get anywhere. So that was a huge mistake. Now, I would tell you that if you're going to design a product, I would say stick with one innovation because when you try to combine innovations, it's a nightmare. Mm. So well, our main innovation on one blade is that our, our head on the razor, which holds the blade, it floats just like a cartridge razor does. So you've got, you've got a safety razor with a floating head. And to build that floating head, the geometries involved mean that you, you, you need to have a spring. So there's an internal spring that's hidden. You can't see it. And also, you can't use a double-sided razor. Because the, 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 the thing needs to float, and it can only float effectively in one, in one, um, in one way, right? It can't, it can't float both ways. So we have a razor, and uh, the, the, the main innovation of, of it is that it is a single-bladed razor, like an old-fashioned safety razor, but that it is safe to use, and it, and it floats just like a cartridge razor, so it's easy to use. And that is a real huge breakthrough, and that is what's powering all the positive responses we're getting. Yeah, no, it's been amazing. We're, you know, I've gone through all the the blogs and the videos, and without exception, everybody's feedback is yes, this is the best razor that's ever been built, which is just awesome. Like I said, Mike, our, our big mistake was that we tried to also innovate the blade material at the same time, and that was right. just, that was way too much R and D for us to take on. We didn't know that when we started, because when you get into a brand new business like products as opposed to information marketing, you you, you just it's it's so difficult it's so much harder to build a good physical product than it is to build a good information product well it's interesting one of the uh the most expensive lines that i've ever come across is wouldn't it be cool if so if you find yourself saying that or your your team member saying wouldn't it be cool if that just that that means money is about to leave your pockets very quickly um, yeah you have to you have to have realistic goals in terms of product development which is what what improvements can we make upon existing models with the budget we have for R&D? Absolutely. So what was the manufacturing process like? Because this is a, a world that I'm getting into for the very first time. And did you guys have these built overseas? W- what was that entire process like for you guys? Lead time, lessons learned, mistakes made? Well, I tell you what, it's been, a, it's been like I said, it's been an absolute nightmare. We, <laughs> we, um, first of all, we... We, you know, we kind of made things difficult on ourselves because we decided from the beginning that we were not going to do what was convenient or what was economic. We were going to do whatever was best. So the very best stainless steel in the world comes from Germany, and it's known as 316L. And so we decided we had to make our handles out of that. So we have, we have powdered uh, 316L stainless steel shipped to 
a manufacturing facility in China. And then we wanted, of course, to make uh, our, our, our product, we wanted to make it indestructible. So we started using, our, to design, to build our razors, we used a new process, which is called MIM. And you'll forgive me that I don't know exactly what it stands for, but, but it's, a, it's a process whereby that, that, that metal is heated with a laser to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit until it melts. Mm. And then it's poured into a mold. So it's metal injection molding. And that allows us to build these razors with incredibly precise tolerances. There's no other way you could machine these things to be so strong and so precise. So the, the parts are made uh, very carefully, very expensively with the highest quality materials that we could find anywhere in the world. And then after that, there's a, a vapor system. It's called PVD. And again, I, I can't remember what all these things stand for, but... There's a polymer that gets vaporized on top of that stainless steel, which makes it just completely impossible for it to ever rust or, or degrade. It's a PVD coating that is a military-grade application for, for steel that has to go through incredible you know, pressures or heats or things like that. So this stuff is just as close to indestructible as, as it can be made. And learning how to do those things while still – while still allowing for the perfect amount of resistance on the floating head and allowing for the blade to be slipped in from the rear. We have a really unusual blade entry and exit system. It's so intuitive and it's so easy, but it was so hard to design. So you just grab a blade, which only has one sharp edge, so you can, you can hold it you know, risk-free from the back, and you just pop it right in the razor and you hear it go click and it's in. And that was such a huge advantage over existing safety razors, which – you have, to, you have to know how to take apart the head. You have to screw it all in. It's not intuitive at all. And so that, that, we think that's a huge improvement for the user experience. You don't have to know anything about how to put this thing together. You, you know, there's a sharp edge. You know where it goes. You throw it in there. You're ready to shave. But, but getting all that stuff so that it worked every time was incredibly difficult and expensive and still is. So we still have a huge problem where we have to finish all of our product by hand. And there, we have to do lots of quality control testing. So Basically, like one out of every three or four of the razors we built gets sent back because it's not functioning perfectly. Mm, and how did you settle on your manufacturer and and negotiate your contract with them? You know, dealing with China, did you hire a consultant here in the United States that spearheaded that for you? Did you go to Asia? What did that process look like? Well, for me, it was easy because I hired a CEO for the business who had tons of experience. So he had two decades of experience in China, and he had a consultant there that he had used for years. So he went to her, and they interviewed a dozen different factories, and they found the guy who had the right size factory. And the right size factory is a factory that, where your contract is important to him. Mm. And so we started out with a small factory, and we're still using them, and they've been great with us. And, uh, that's how, that's exactly how it happened. I would highly recommend if you don't if you're not able to hire someone with lots of experience in product design and manufacturing that you certainly go with a proven consultant. And a great way to find those people is just using a recruiter. That's super valuable. That's that's something that I'm going to be tackling here come February for the very first time and it scares the shit out of me frankly. So, <laughs> well, I'm happy also to put you in touch with uh with with Todd and 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 I'm sure he could refer you to his um his consultant. Yeah, that'd be that'd be unbelievably helpful. So the other big piece about one blade that's gotten a ton of press, and I've literally watched YouTube videos on this, is that people are having like these huge unpackaging ceremonies, if you will, because they get this thing in the mail and the packaging's just second to none, and it's like it's its own experience. Uh, it reminds me of what people, you know, say or how they feel when they're unboxing a new Apple product for the very first time, where so much thought and care went into the packaging. Um, that that's its own, uh, almost like its own product at that point. Yep, uh, that's uh, that was certainly our inspiration, and uh, you know we just don't think a good box should go wasted. So we we take uh, this is uh, again this is a sort of um, it'll tell you a little bit how maniacal I am about uh, how interested I am in just I only really want the best of everything in life, and I, I you know it's such a funny thing, but I, I learned this a long time ago from one of my best friends growing up. His name is Eric Swetchy, and I won't bore you with all the details, but he was just a maniac about uh, living a, a very disciplined life. And so he was a, a, a top football player. He got a Division I scholarship, and he was the best weightlifter, and he was the best track athlete. And he, he could do all these things physically that no one else could do. And I, and I was just friends with him, and I, I was intrigued by how successful he was in sports. And I said, 
you know, Eric, how come you're so much stronger, so much faster, so much better than these other guys? He goes, well, I wasn't born that way. You know, every, every day since I was seven years old, I've tried to live the perfect life. So I get up at six in the morning and I go do all these different exercises and then I study hard and then I, and then when I'm done with school, I go do a whole bunch of more exercises and I do it every day. And I'm like, how could you do that? He goes, if I didn't do it every day, I'd never be able to do it. He goes, Porter, you got to understand excellence is only possible if it's a habit. It has to be something that you do every day. It has to be something that you do every single day. Every time you do anything, you always have to do it your best. Otherwise, you'll never be able to maintain the discipline. And, and it's to the point where like when, when, it, when I go to his house now and we play pool or something, he puts the cue balls back in the box after every game. <laughs> and he puts them back in the box in order where the numbers are spun up to the top where you see them all. So they go back in the box exactly as he got them. So everything in his life is that regimented and that perfect. And no surprise, he's been incredibly successful in life. He's, a, he's one of the world's top commercial uh, real estate brokers. And it's no wonder why because why, everyone would want to have that guy as their broker. He does everything in his life as, as well as he can. And so for me, with one blade, I, I wanted to build the perfect tool for shaving. I wanted to use all of the best t- technology. I wanted to use all the best materials. And I didn't care what it cost. You know, I didn't care how much we'd have to price it in terms of the retail price because I just know that there are people out there who just want the best of everything. I mean, Mike, you and I are into cars. What's a, what's a Ferrari 458 cost? Sure, 300 grand. Yeah, and how much more is that than a Chevy Malibu? You know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> significantly <laughs> yeah i don't know it's it's 20 or 40 x or something right I and mean, it's worth every single penny it's because driving a ferrari is nothing like driving a chevy malibu and i promise for those of you who are out there who, who think why in the world would anyone buy a 300 hundred dollar razor well you wouldn't unless you have ever tried it and then you understand immediately and by the way just as a plug for my product here the 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 cost of shaving every day is significantly less than shaving with a cartridge razor because the blade is cheap. You know, it's less than a dollar for a new blade every day. So you can get a perfect shave every day for under a dollar, and there's no way you can do that with a cartridge razor. The the cost of play is that the handle, you know, is expensive. So I'm sorry, I I, I got lost in all of this, but I want to tell you about the um the packaging because the same passion for for having the best things ex- is exhibited when you first get the product. So one of the things I really love about this product is that we number every single razor that we make. There's a laser etched number on the floating head on the underside of it. And that number is, is um, the actual number and order that it was manufactured. So you can know exactly when and, and, and the, in this time frame of our, of our business, when your product was made. And we actually were able to sell the first 101 that we made as collectibles for $1,000, which helped us raise some of the capital we needed for the business. Anyway, so the, so it's numbered, and when you get your product, when you get your box, when you get your one blade box, it, it's a the the box is covered in uh, gray construction paper, and you, the number of your razor is printed on the paper, mm. so that you know someone <laughs> looked at what razor number it was, made the paper, and wrapped your box individually. So there's just a ton of care and precision that goes into everything we've done for this product. Now, why would we wrap the, pro- why would we wrap the box in paper? Well, we're wrapping the box in paper because the box is handmade as well, and it's made out of full-grain leather. So this is the most expensive leather that you can buy. And we cut it by hand, and then it's sewn. The corners are sewn up to form a box. So the box is a beautiful leather good that you can use for traveling, or you can do what I do, which is I keep all my blades in it. On, the, on, my, on my sink and on, in my bathroom, so it looks beautiful. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful leather box. And then from there, when you open it up, you discover that we haven't just sold you a three hundred dollar beautiful stainless steel shaving razor. We've also included a a fully solid steel stand that holds the razor horizontally, so it dries perfectly, and is it is a half a pound of solid three one six L German stainless steel, so it'll never it'll never rust. It'll you know. It's, a, it's an amazing – when you get the product and you open it up and you see the, the quality of the material and the manufacturing that we've done, you, you know exactly why it costs $300. Mm, that's awesome. You know, when we were, you brought up the, the Ferrari part, what people don't realize, if you haven't had that experience, you know, like you mentioned earlier, is that a $300 razor in the same way that a Ferrari does is it turns a mundane everyday task into an unbelievable experience. And it goes – you know – it's so funny when you've got 
a car like that at your disposal, you are looking for reasons to go to the grocery store or that's go right. run an errand. Yeah. You know? So that's, that's really what you're selling here is you're getting rid of a daily chore and you're replacing it with an unbelievably unique and special experience that you get to have every single day. What we say is transform your routine into a ritual. Right. And, you know, the whole idea about this also, the, I mean, a bigger idea is you don't, you, you don't have to be a millionaire to have the world's best razor. Yeah. No, exactly. You know, and, you, you know, and there are things like that in your life that you're going to do every single day. And there's no reason for you to not to have the best. You should spend as much money as it takes to have the bed that you want. Because you're going to spend so much of your life in that, on the, in that damn bed, right? Why not have $1,000 linens? You're going to use them every day for 10 years. Yeah, no, agreed. Agreed, same, agreed. I feel exactly the same way about, about certain things in my life. You know, I mean, I don't want to have cheap underwear. I'll save money somewhere else. I don't, I don't want to have cheap linens or towels. I'll save money somewhere else. And I definitely don't want to have a cheap razor because that's, that's something that I, I want to do every day and I want to be able to enjoy it. So when did the company officially launch? Well, we kind of had two launches. We had a soft launch in July, just to readers of my newsletter. Mm-hmm, I remember that. Just kind of like a beta launch to see, uh, you know, to get a really good assessment of the quality of our products. And I'm really glad we did that. We sold about 100 razors, and we found that about 5% of them had a flaw still. So we were able to get those back and then re- rebuild them all appropriately. And, and, and the, you know, it was such a minor design problem. It didn't – fortunately, of course, no one hurt themselves or anything like that. But um, some of the razor heads, the design was, was – p- some people put two blades in them instead of one. Mm. <laughs> And that caused the the razor head to open up slightly, where then the next time they put a razor in, it just fell through. Mm. So the the catching mechanism was 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 not built perfectly. So we went back, we redesigned it, and uh, then we launched again uh, in in um, in November. And since we since our real launch, if you will, has has happened, uh, we've sold uh, something around a thousand razors so far. So we're still very early in in the process. But luckily, we've gotten just great reviews and uh, lots of media attention, and uh, I think uh, I think it's going to work. Well, you know, it's interesting. That's that's the number one thought that I'm having as well. I, I share your philosophy when it comes to quality, which is my number one priority for for my hydroponics product, which is it it will be uh, the most expensive product on the market because that's because that's because it will be the best quality product on the market. And if you nail quality the first time and you get the good reviews then the rest of it becomes easy down that road. But if you've got a crappy product and a lot of bad reviews, you are, you are fighting an uphill battle at that point. When you launched the product, you guys have gotten a ton of press and a ton of PR. Was there a team behind that that you had hired internally? Did you hire a third-party you know, PR company to run that for you? What did that process look like? Yeah, Todd, um, we, right now we're running the company with uh, just two full-time employees uh, we have uh, we work with a fulfillment center to do the the shipping and the packaging, and we we have a, a, mar- a full time marketing employee and we have a CEO. So we're still you know a very small business, but luckily the internet allows you to you know you don't have to build the storefront, you don't have to have eight or ten people working in the shop. Uh, so it's it's good that way, and we have already sold razors all over the world. For the PR, we we went with a, a local firm in Austin uh, that Todd wanted to work with, and we spent a very very small amount of money. I don't want to. I don't want to say out loud how much we spent because I make things <laughs> difficult for that firm. But we spent a t- – our, our PR budget was absolutely tiny. And it was very helpful in that they got us our first couple of big magazine articles. And what's important about that is as soon as you have that, then other magazines and other press are willing to write about you. Somehow there's a, there's a dam that has to break. And the other thing – the other uh, – very helpful was that our design firm um, – the Pensa guys in uh, New York, they had good connections with New York media and they were very proud of the razor that we built and they were proud to be a part of the design team. So they were very eager to be interviewed about it and to talk about it. So that was very helpful as well. That was, that was, a, that was a great return on our investment with them beyond the quality of their design work. Mm, absolutely. And on the packaging side, did you guys hire a, a packaging boutique, a specialist in that regard? No, the packaging, the ideas for the packaging mostly came from our CEO, from Todd Barrett. Okay. And, and that's all done in Asia as well at the, at the manufacturing plant? Yeah. We ship leather from Texas. We ship it over to China. Mm. And then uh, we make it all over there and we send it all back. As we say in our packaging, our, 
Our business was born in Austin, Texas, <laughs> from from materials all over the world, assembled in China, and and designed in Brooklyn, New York. Man, that's amazing. What was the lead time like when the you know the molds are ready, the assembly line is ready? Uh, where you're like, okay, let's let's go to get everything built, you know, your first batch and then all the way through customs back into the United States. Is that a, is that a six month process, a 12 month process? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know the details of, of, of that exactly. I know it takes us, uh, I've, t- I've talked with Todd, it takes us, uh, you know, a while to build these things. We're still, we're still mostly building them by hand. Although of course we're not, we're obviously not melting steel by hand. There are parts of it that we're using machines uh, but the final assembly is all being done by hand. And I think our maximum throughput right now is like maybe 100 razors a week. So gotcha. it's it's very time consuming. Uh, and then we just ship them all back from China to a warehouse in Austin and then we distribute globally from there. You know, I, I think there's a lot of people out there who would look at the shaving market and think that there was no opportunity there because you've got so much competition and so many brands and, you know, what was your thought process around that and why was that not even a, a consideration or an issue for you? Uh, that's a great question. There isn't, in our, in, our, in our market research, we didn't see anyone at all in the world trying to do what we were trying to do. There was no pre-existing, pre-existing luxury shaving market. There's luxury watches. There's luxury handbags. There's luxury perfumes and there's luxury booze. There's luxury uh, travel, uh, but there was no one out there who was trying to build a luxury type shaving product. So we we actually thought that there was a, a very uh, open, wide open market niche. Of course, Mike, you'll appreciate this uh, based on your experiences in life today. And I'm sure you know that if there's no product in the niche you're thinking of, there may be a good reason why. Right. <laughs> so we, we really had no idea whether or not we'd be able to sell it. And unfortunately, there just isn't an efficient way to test. With an idea product, you can go out there and see if anyone will buy it. If they don't, then you don't have to follow through. You can turn, you can give them their money back and you, everyone moves on. With a product, you have to spend so much time and money and energy and capital building it first. And that makes it much riskier. Well, it's interesting. It, 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 it's definitely risky. It's much more capital intensive. But at the same time, I don't know if there's a safer bet out there than to go ahead and take the position of we're going to go into a proven niche that does billions of dollars a year in existing revenue, but we're going to carve out our little slice of that by producing the single best product in in that market. Like there will always be buyers for the best of the best in any given product category. I agree with you. And I think our I think what really made investors interested in this project was that the truth of the matter is we can we can deliver the best shave in the world at a daily use price point that is far less than the mass market crap. So it's like it's like being able to drive a Ferrari for the price of a Chevy Malibu. And right. everyone's going to want that. Right, agreed. So what's next for your vision of the business? Or did it did it satisfy your itch to develop this product and now you have it personally or do you have a bigger vision for the company? What what's next? Yeah, I I do. I <laughs> I'm crazy enough to want to keep doing this. Uh, I have some other ideas for one products, and so we call this one blade. And yes, it has one blade, but but one also signifies that it's the simply the best. And I think there are other things, other categories out there where we can apply our passion for for the best materials and the best results to other uh, large markets. So I'm hopeful that we can start with this, uh, prove out our brand and our approach, and then move into other product categories, uh, different from men's shaving, but, um, but, but all luxury related and, uh, ho- and hopefully for us, uh, high margin. Man, that's brilliant. I love that. I, I didn't even consider pursuing one and the quality of the product and making that the primary business model and moving into different categories. That's great. Yeah, we, we, we want to focus in high margin, high volume uh, businesses for sure. Those are the ones that we really understand and we think that there's great potential in. But yeah, there's other, there, are, there are other things percolating. <laughs> I'm dying to ask you what, but I know that you'll probably want to keep that, keep that for another, another episode down the road. Yeah, I don't um, say just yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I totally get it. Well, this has been super valuable, Porter. What, hey, what, Mike, yeah. before, before I move along, can I, I want to say one thing because I'm afraid um, – I've gotten some criticism about about building this product in China, 
And I wanted to address that because we didn't decide to build it in China because it was cheap. Nothing we've done on this product was done because it was cheap. Trust me, not one thing. We, we did not make one decision on this product based on economics whatsoever. We actually went to China because that's where the most skilled manufacturing labor is. It's not cheap at all to build these things. And we could have probably built it for far less here in America, but we couldn't have gotten the quality. And that's one thing I don't think people appreciate about, about China's manufacturing industry. It's come a long way in 30 years. It's, China is no longer the cheapest place to build things, but, it, but in many cases, it's the best. No, I agree. I, I'm, I'm quite confident that if Apple wanted to manufacture the iPhone here in the United States, the facilities to do it don't even exist. They don't, and you can't get, you can't get the political approval to build them. Right. So anyways, I just want to address that topic because I think there's some people listening who, you know, who might misunderstand why we chose China and, and they don't, they just don't, I don't think it's common knowledge and I would like to spread the word out there that, you know, America is great at lots of things, but it's not great at manufacturing anymore. No, agreed. It's, um, you know, China is the highest tech, you know, has the highest tech facilities in the world when it comes to that stuff. So that's a, that's a good point. It's something that I've thought about from a branding perspective because you'd love to have that Made in the USA sticker on there and to have that as a part of your story. But uh, at the end of the day, it just doesn't make sense financially or, uh, or from a quality perspective. Yeah, and we wanted the best. So we went to where we could get the best results. So what would you like to leave uh, with everybody who's listening today? You know, we've obviously got a huge audience of men. We've got a, and most of them are entrepreneurs there's been a ton of valuable lessons and nuggets dropped here over the last 40 minutes. But if you had one final piece of advice or two that you've learned, whether it's a lesson learned, um, you know, or, or words of wisdom for someone who's going to create a physical products uh, business. The best, the best decision I made was I, I spent a lot of time and money finding the right CEO. I could have never, I could have never done this without his experience and his drive. And he hops on a plane and goes to China about every three weeks for us. And that would have worn me out. I would have never, ever succeeded without him. Mm. Best thing I did was I hired a guy with experience who was willing to work his butt off to make this happen. And then the worst thing I did was I tried to do two innovations at the same time. So if you're gonna if you're gonna beat the existing market, then make your product one step better, but don't try to make it two steps better because it, it really adds a lot of complexity. Agreed. I found that to be the case for for my development as well. We 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 scratch the whole second set of innovations that we're going to do and we're saving that for model two. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. 2.0. Yeah. Now on your CEO, you know, from a compensation standpoint, uh, a person with that level of experience doesn't come cheap. And so if you're in a startup phase, you know, the, the questions arise is he compensated with equity in the business on performance? Is it strictly salary? Um, you know, that's, that's something that I think every startup has to navigate at some point. Yeah, I had I had what I thought was a pretty clever solution to that problem. Would you be willing to share? Uh, of course, yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm being a little too self congratulatory, but um, what I did was I found her. I, I, again, I used a recruiter, and recruiters are free to, uh, until they find you the person. Then they get a, depending on the deal, they get a portion of that guy's first year salary, assuming he stays. So I found a recruiter that I was comfortable working with. And he found us several candidates, which ironically, one of one of whom was the the, can, the perfect candidate that I described to him. So he actually went out and got me the CEO of Ronco. But we still went through the whole process. We met with these guys. And Todd knew that he was not my only candidate. He knew that there were other people in the running for this job. And be, I think probably because of the funding that we had, uh, Mike, you know, I'm I'm on good terms with, um, fortunately, a lot of very wealthy investors through my uh, investment newsletter business. Mm-hmm. So he knew there was real funding behind this project, and, and he was impressed with the success I'd had as a direct marketer. So he thought for sure we'd figure out a way to sell it. So he, he was, you know, it wasn't your typical startup in some ways. It was well-funded, and there was great marketing behind it. So he was very eager to participate. And so what I told him was, I said, hey, Todd, listen, you, I'll be honest with you. You're my first choice. But you should know there's other people that I think can, can do the job, and they're, 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 they're also willing to sign up. So... I don't want to ever have a discussion with you about money again. I'd like for you to design a compensation package that you feel like is competitive and that you'll be happy with. And I just want you to know that it'll never change. It won't matter if we sell a billion dollars in raisers. I'm never going to give you a raise. You're never going to get any more stock. So come up with what you think is that you can be happy with and, um, and that you think is competitive. Because if you ask for too much, I'm going to hire somebody else. So Todd went back and he designed his own compensation package. 
And it was it was a great test of whether or not we were going to get along as partners. Right. Because it was it was exactly down the middle. He was neither greedy nor cheap. Mm. And uh, it was we've had we've had we've always had a great working relationship. And that's exactly the kind of guy you have to have if you want to be successful as a startup. You can't have a guy, by the way, who says he'll work for free because he'll never do anything. And you can't have a guy who says he wants the sun, the moon, and the stars because you can't afford it. Well, and I'm going to bet that a big part of his compensation plan is based upon his performance and revenue. You know, the better he does, the more he gets paid, I'm assuming. <laughs> you know? Well, you, 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 you would be surprised. I'm, I don't want to comment on his compensation package because there, there are parts of it that I think are unique. And uh, I, I don't want to say, but, I, I, but I'll just tell you that it's, that, uh, that's not uh, – I'll tell you that's not the main thrust of his contract. Interesting. Well, I think the strategy was brilliant. Um, you get to find out so much about the person w- just by their response, and uh, you gave, you're basically giving them all the rope that they need to either you know lasso the wind by or hang themselves. And so, it's, it, and it's a great thing that there's complete clarity about that. There's just total clarity. Yeah. He can't ever come to me and complain about his compensation package because he designed it. Right. Right. That's great. That's brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Porter, thank you so much for the time today. Where should people go to pick up their one blade? Well, uh, they, they can do this, which is just go to our website. Uh, it's onebladeshave.com. If you go there, you can also see a lot of the reviews that we've been talking about, the magazine articles and some of the, the blog testimonials we've gotten. Or even better, uh, Mike, I'm going to be sending you some copy that uh, our own Mike Palmer wrote. And there's a special offer uh, for, for Christmas uh, as a part of that package. So perhaps you can entice your uh, readers to click on that link. And then we would, of course, give you some kind of a commission for the sale. Ah, oh, got it. Well, I appreciate that very much. I will, uh, I will include both and let the audience choose which direction they would like to go. But You're, uh, wise, you're a wise man. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I congratulate you on, you know, setting the standard uh, you know, once again, with every business that you've created, it's been uh, such a valuable lessons learned for me. Just you know, observing everything that you've done with Stansbury, everything you're doing with One Blade, and so it's been uh, something that I've been unbelievably appreciative of to at least just observe and follow in your footsteps because uh, it's just you know the way you build your your products and your businesses are for all the right reasons, and uh, that's a very rare thing these days. Well, I'm very fortunate, Mike. I have got I've got great partners who have been uh, behind me all the way, and uh, that's that's a you know what we should have a whole podcast about that how to how to find the right partners and keep them because the, that's really the secret of success in life. Think about how important your wife becomes to you. Think about how important your your friends are, and uh, and how just the people you associate with inevitably influence you in such powerful ways. Well, Porter, I will absolutely take take you up on that opportunity. That would be unbelievably valuable. I'm sure the audience would love it as well. So thank you so much for your time here today and for your participation and your leadership here at Self Made Man. And uh, guys, go check out onebladeshave.com and check out the notes for the link below here, uh, below the episode as well. So Porter, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. You're very welcome, Mike. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. 